You're very welcome, everybody, to the second week of our discussion of Primo Levi's novel, The Truce. Today, in looking at The Truce, I'd like to focus on what you might call the inner logic of this book, the way the novel works, sometimes subliminally, on different levels. So, first of all, we have what we might call the documentary level, the factual level. We have a richly detailed account of an actual journey that takes place just after the liberation of Auschwitz. This journey starts in January 1945 and ends the following October. It moves across Poland, the USSR, Romania, Hungary, Slovakia, Austria, Germany, and finally home to Italy. Along the way, we get specific facts about the war. We get specific names of places and people, and we have vivid, colorful, often comical descriptions of events and scenes. A man trying to mime a chicken, a Roman stall holder selling a shirt while hiding a hole in the shirt of his thumb, a Greek man winning the affection of a barracks of Italian soldiers by talking to them about Tagliatelle and the Juventus football team. The novel proceeds in straightforward chronological order, and it's concerned with preserving facts for posterity. But the book is also very artfully put together. It has a, a, an emotional impact on the reader that can't be easily explained, that's greater than the sum of its parts. We can start by looking at the title, The Truce, La Tregua in Italian. And this idea of the truce has several different meanings that come up uh, across the novel. The word comes up in the novel in a passage when, uh, fairly early on when Levy is describing Russian soldiers. The war was about to end, Levy writes, the long, long war that had devastated their country. For them, it was already over. It was the great truce, for the hard time that was to follow hadn't yet begun, nor had the cursed name of the Cold War been uttered. They were cheerful, sad, and tired, and were satisfied with food and wine, like the companions of Ulysses after beaching their ships. So here we see the truce as a time between one moment and another, after the old order is over, but the new order has not yet begun, a form of disorder that takes place between two orders. But look also in this passage at how Levy slides imperceptibly from very material questions to a mythological comparison. The Russian soldiers suffer from fatigue, hunger, and thirst, and then they're compared to characters in an ancient epic, the companions of Homer's Ulysses. This is another meaning of truce in the book. It's a moment where the distinction between the material and the mythic is suspended. The disenchanted world, the world, the deprived world, needs to be re-enchanted again. The world needs to be filled with myth. And this is one of the things that Levy undertakes in this book, the remythification of the world. So where does this process start, re-enchanting the world? To get to myth and miracle, this novel suggests, we must start with bare facts. The truce, in fact, suggests that this is the first job of anyone coming out of a disaster. The first job is to take stock of what happened. And this is how the novel opens. In the Bunamonovitz infirmary, Levy tells us on the first page, 800 of us remained. Of these, around 500 died of their illnesses or of cold or hunger before the Russians arrived, and 200 others in the days immediately following. In other words, before we can move on, we need a truce, a pause, when bare facts can be accounted for. A moment, a ceasefire, in which one can literally, in this case, count the bodies. That's part of the meaning, I think, of the opening chapter, the thaw, il disgelo in Italian. In this opening moment, 
Levy looks at what is revealed by the retreating ice and snow in a, in a literal sense as the spring slowly arrives, but also metaphorically as the truth of what has happened during the war emerges in the encounters Levy will have with other survivors of the war whose stories he will record for us. With spring comes the return of life, and it's the return of life that this book is most concerned with narrating. Not the return of goodness or moral rectitude, but the return of life itself. Levy watches and describes how after the emptiness and nothingness, the vuoto and nulla, as he calls it, of Nazism, life, vitality, human, human variety, return spontaneously of their own accord, like green shoots after the winter. Since it's a book that describes what happens straight after the Holocaust, it's a surprise to many readers how funny it is, how, how much comedy there is in it, and also how little energy is expended in this book on moral judgment. The truth of the title is a suspension, in fact, of moral judgment. That is one of the ceasefires that the title refers to. Levy does not spend his efforts in this novel on condemning Nazism or judging the people who brutalized him, which is not to say he lets them off the hook. That judgment will come, that reckoning will come, but in another moment. Right now, what he's concerned with is figuring out what in the world is the opposite of Nazism, the opposite of Auschwitz, and decides to give energy and attention to that. That's what he observes in this book, not the triumph of moral good over evil, but the simple, basic, unstoppable eruption of life out of nothingness. <laughs> 